When I was a kid and just beginning my journey into the world of gaming, between the questionable dress-up games and downloads that give the computer viruses, I found myself playing a lot of games based on movies and TV shows. I loved watching Disney Channel, Cartoon Network, and Nickelodeon, the children's media holy trinity if you will, and I was pretty much always staring up at the TV. But when I wasn't busy watching a TV show, I was probably busy playing a game based around my favorite things to watch. One show I really liked was That's So Raven, a sitcom about a psychic teenage girl that has the ability to see into the future and an amazing sense of fashion. The fashion part isn't in the official show description, I just think that she deserves some credit for her fits. So going off of this premise, it only makes sense that this That's So Raven Game Boy game I loved to play as a kid would include Raven chasing monkeys, strutting through boiler rooms, and throwing pies. You know, her classic move of always throwing pies at her enemies. That's so Raven. To be fair, the show itself did have the characters getting up to some pretty wacky antics, but it never went quite as far as breaking into the alligator enclosure at the zoo and leaping over pits of fire. While this was one of the first games I played as a kid that was based on existing media, other games based on more shows and movies that probably shouldn't have been made into games found their way into my collection over the years. And thinking back on it now, as much as I didn't think about it at all when I was younger, these games usually kinda sucked. I played plenty of online games based on shows and movies growing up too, but the physical games tended to promise more of an experience, a chance to play as or with the characters in the world that they're from and on some kind of adventure, instead of only being one-off mini-games on the internet. But just because the physical games tended to seem better and cooler because they cost money and were locked behind a shiny case in the electronics section of Walmart, doesn't mean that they were actually very very good. If the disaster of the E.T. game made for the Atari in 1983 that had all of its remaining copies thrown into a pit in the desert because it was so bad is anything to go by, it's clear that this sort of phenomenon of not just games based on existing media, but pretty bad games based on movies and TV has been around for a while. But in the 2000s, gaming was starting to pick up as a hobby for more casual players, as games were a lot easier to make than ever before and were now being made about anything and everything. And what's easier to make a game about than something that already has predetermined characters, settings, and storylines? Well, you would think it'd be easy, but a lot of these titles based on existing shows and movies ended up a lot of the time being pretty cheap nonsensical, hard to play or look at, or just generally bad. It's like most of the developers behind these games watched like 20 minutes of the source material for reference, made up some vaguely related game premise, and slapped the media's branding on the cover. Clearly I have some feelings about diving into a game about one of my favorite shows, only to be met with psychic pies. It's not that throwing pies at enemies is bad or really all that weird of a mechanic on its own, it's just that it feels kind of out of place in a That's So Raven game, because as goofy as the actual show gets, it doesn't usually involve Raven crawling through underground tunnels at the mall and dodging wizard magic attacks. Or pies, for that matter. Aside from questionable elements though, I wouldn't say that this game was all bad. It did have a fashion and dress up section along with a disguise mechanic which is a recurring trope throughout the actual show. And again, the show was pretty silly and over the top, so as far as recreating a similar atmosphere and a game that felt somewhat like a playable episode, this game actually did a decent job on most parts. Not all the parts, but some of them. So the Raven game really isn't the worst of them, though I still think the battle with a monkey was a little out of pocket. <laughs> Another Disney Channel production I loved admittedly way more than Raven was High School Musical. So of course when I saw High School Musical live in the dream in the holy shiny display case, I knew I had to have this game. But as much as I have some critiques about That So Raven's game, they are nothing compared to the travesty that is this High School Musical, um, experience. 
The cover and cartridge for this game really made me believe that it would be all about the second movie that had recently come out back in 2007. If you know anything about High School Musical and have a bit of taste, you'll know that the second movie is obviously the best of the trilogy, so imagine my disappointment. When the box art drew me in, the cartridge with its summery blue pool water background got my hopes up, only to be dropped into a game that takes place in the setting of High School Musical 1. But maybe this is just the beginning, maybe it's not all bad? Well look, here's Troy and Gabriella from the second movie! Forget the fact that they look more like Trey and Gabrielle, this is getting close to the content that I'm after. Except, no. As soon as off-brand Troy disappears, he transforms back into his look from the original movie, which includes a totally different hairstyle and color and outfit and everything. I don't know if the developers of this game just thought we wouldn't notice that these characters are setting up some sort of time-traveling lore in the High School Musical universe, but I was very unimpressed as a kid and clearly still haven't gotten over it. But don't worry, to make up for the lack of decent movie content and major continuity errors, there's still tons of fun gameplay, like jumping over paper airplanes, climbing stairs, and dance battling random NPCs in the world's laziest rhythm game. Wow, she's, she's really, really good. good. The premise of this game and its accompanying disappointment reminds me of the Raven game because it's just so far removed from the source material. The bootleg cast of characters in this game are not a one-off phenomenon either. Most of the games that feature existing human characters tended to include some version of them in the game that was just not... Correct. <laughs> I know that games in general were definitely less graphically superior back in the day, and I especially don't think that there was usually a huge budget when it came to something like the fourth installment of an iCarly game. <laughs> but I still think that these uncanny abominations are <laughs> worth mentioning if only because they help prove my point that most of these movie and TV games were pretty bad all around. And I don't know why the developers making these games felt that every movie and TV show needed to be made into an adventure platformer, of all things, like it's the only game genre that exists, but clearly there's a bit of a theme going. I have a working theory that it must have been the cheapest and easiest type of game to make because while High School Musical would have benefited from something more song or dance related, and that so Raven could have featured more fashion or psychic related gimmicks, those are not the games that we got. To be fair, there was a High School Musical themed Just Dance knockoff and a singing game that both later released on the Wii, but before that, we got this, which is a bit underwhelming to say the least. But not all of these games were weird platformers with bad plots and even worse sprites. A lot did still involve jumping through vaguely themed levels and collecting random items as part of the gameplay, but there were some games I played that more closely resembled the media they were based on, which has to count for something. The Finding Nemo game for the PS2 had you play through different stages that were based around plot points in the movie, basically making an interactive version of the film with some extra mini-games thrown in in between. With a sequence of swimming away from the kidnapping diver that made me unnecessarily panicked, bouncing over jellyfish and swimming alongside Crush and the rest of the turtles in the current, this game was clearly really faithful to the media it was based on, and had enough diversity in its gameplay to keep you engaged. To be fair, most of the games I played as a kid were usually on the DS and Game Boy, which are a lot more limited compared to the PS2 as far as graphics and capabilities go, but still, it wasn't just the fact that the other games weren't the nicest to look at, it was that they didn't even feel like they tried to make a decent game instead opting for rehashed platformers that have almost nothing to do with the source material. The first Chronicles of Narnia movie, for example, had a Game Boy title released for it, which I, of course, was also easily tempted by, despite my poor history with these type of games up until this point. This game still might not look the best, but it actually followed the storyline of the movie, which was a breath of fresh air after the various battles of the other games, whether dance or monkey related. In this Narnia game, you play through each plot point of the movie again, though with a bit more fighting... whatever these things are. 
I thought I might be able to tell after all of these years, but the graphics are so bad that I can't tell, and the game just calls them creatures when they're first introduced. Truly the world's biggest unsolved mystery. Bratz Rock Angels for the Game Boy was structured in a similar way where you basically just play through an interactive version of the movie but with a few mini games thrown in to spice up the gameplay. And it doesn't look the prettiest, but it's still a better themed experience than the paper airplane enemies in High School Musical created. So these games aren't quite as creative as some of the others like them in that they stick to existing characters and settings, but they're at least familiar, though at the same time, maybe they're a little too familiar? As much as it felt kind of out of place to be jumping over alligators and throwing pies as Raven, does that deserve more credit than games based on a movie, based on a book, that just rehashed the plot and even exact lines of dialogue from the source material and call it a game? I don't know, maybe my standards are set a little too high for games based on children's media. I mean, I clearly didn't have much problem playing these games anyway when I was younger, though they still didn't capture my attention for very long. I think that's due to the fact, though, that a lot of these games felt impossible to beat. Whether it was the Nemo game, the game based on Disney's Chicken Little from 2005, this WALL-E puzzle game for the DS, or SeaWorld's ironic game about Shamu breaking out of his enclosure and traveling through the open sea, whatever the subject matter or gameplay style, it was pretty common for me to feel like these games were just entirely unbeatable. It could of course have a lot to do with the fact that I was just a kid and didn't really know what I was doing, but I will also out myself here by saying that when going back to a lot of these games over the years as an adult, I still found that I had a lot of trouble trying to progress through them. That might just mean that my brain has barely developed since the age of Bratz Rock Angels. But I would also like to make a point that since these games were typically made as quick and cheap cash grabs, I doubt many of the developers were actually worried about optimizing the gameplay or easing the difficulty level on these titles. I think it still might mostly just be me though. I'm a real gamer, I swear! Obviously my experience with most of these games wasn't the best, especially looking back on it now without being blinded by my undying love for Trey, I mean Troy, but it turns out that not all of these games were necessarily bad. Especially when it comes to certain franchises that have so many games centered around them, there's bound to be at least one that's kinda good. The nearly 25 year old franchise of Spongebob has countless pieces of merchandise and movies and spin-offs and included in the vast world of Spongebob products are a good amount of Spongebob physical game titles. Like a lot. There are driving games, drawing games, platformers, mini game collections, restaurant simulators, plug and plays. One Spongebob game I really liked to play was the CD-ROM version of the game version of the movie version of the regular show. It may not look like much compared to the more expansive PS2 version, basically just being a glorified point and click setup, but it was still really fun to be in the world, interact with the characters, and had just the right amount of newness and creativity to not feel either underwhelming or totally confusing. And Battle for Bikini Bottom is a title that was such a fan favorite that it recently got a remaster release on the Switch. It checks all the boxes for having an in-depth world, varying level designs, and gameplay that was actually fun instead of just thrown in for the heck of it. Other franchises like Shrek, Garfield, Muppets, and Looney Tunes also developed a full collection of games based around them over the years, with networks like Nick and Cartoon Network even making games based in their respective cartoon cinematic universes. Still disappointed that Disney didn't do this, I would have loved to play as a Jonas Brother beating up Phineas and Ferb in a Disney Channel themed fighting game. There is usually at least one kind of racing game made for each of these franchises just to cover their bases, but there's a lot of other genres thrown into the mix from anything to even more platformers to sports like this Nicktoons themed basketball game. Between all of these games from all of these franchises, I guess they can't all be that bad. 
Although a lot of these games can actually be pretty fun, I still feel like their existence is mainly overshadowed by all of the duds that come along with them. Even if Muppet Race Mania is arguably one of the best racing games of all time, all of the other blatant cash grabs that make up the rest of these titles don't exactly set a good example for the genre. Am I saying that none of the older games ever should have existed? I don't think so, but I am saying that even though I still actually own all of the bad Game Boy and DS games I played as a kid, with the more advanced technology of today, I'm grateful that compressed Game Boy versions of my favorite TV characters are a thing of the past. So long, Trey and Gabrielle. A huge thank you to B22, Bradley T, Kayla Geary, Brett Morgan, Bunzo, Dylan Webb, Hayden, Joe Cheesman, Johan Aik, Kevin Evans, Mark Kent, Mr. Pants, M. Wee, Paper Sam, Pixel Puppy, Sarah, The Goomba Mattress, Theodore Nicola Wileus, Unin Almondor, and the rest of my patrons for supporting me. I was inspired by Raven's Psychic Pies, and I've decided to start my own line of Dream Jelly Virtual Pies available just for patrons. Great for throwing at enemies, frenemies, and evil wizards alike.